Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where our goal is to help you find health and community through movement. I'm Molly Herford, a writer, coach, and yoga teacher. And I'm Peter Glassford, an endurance coach and kinesiologist. Every week, we're talking to athletes and experts who can help you lead your best active, adventurous life. Whether you're a gravel racer, a marathon runner, or you just got out on your first bike ride yesterday, we're here cheering you on. You can also visit us online at consummateathlete.com for coaching information and training tips, nutrition advice, yoga flows, bike skills, and more. And now, let's get into this week's episode. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. We are between the first World Cups of the year for cross-country mountain biking, so I'm excited. And when I say between, we are literally recording between the two races in the gap between the intermission. Yes, and it is very early. This is like the worst time of the year before. Um, I like cyclocross better. That's that's the hill I'm going to die on. And it's partially because daylight savings time shifts us in the fall so that uh, we're only five hours off of uh, Central European time. So when you're watching the races, instead of having to wake up at 5 a.m., you can wake up at 6 a.m. to, right. to get the women's that's race. Right. Yeah, I don't know that we can say it's still early, but maybe early for recording. But we're up and we're we're somewhat peppy. Somewhat peppy. Uh, so today um, we're, we're talking about sort of our, our four C's of being a consummate athlete. And we decided we wanted to record this because it's been over a year since we recorded the episode of what is a consummate athlete. Uh, and since then, I mean, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say that anything in our philosophy has changed, but it, it's a question we get asked a fair bit. And, you know, we have a lot of new listeners. What, what now. question do we get asked? What is a consummate okay. athlete? Okay, yeah. And we realized, you know, last year we were sort of describing a consummate athlete, but this year we kind of wanted to talk about what qualities make up a consummate athlete. Well, this is a framework that I use, you know, I, I was saying to you, and this is sort of how we've gotten down, you know, recording this is that I was sort of describing to you that these are four things that I'm sort of looking at when I'm doing phone consults with people or looking at my own coaching clients or, or just my own training, you know, where are these gaps? And sometimes what that's what frameworks are nice for is to see sort of like general rule of thumbs, you know, areas we could work on again, this gaps analysis, we, we might say this, right? So we have this four C's framework for consummate athlete. Uh, it's very nice. It's all C's. It's a good, you know, we love a good acronym. I hate a good yeah, acronym. Yeah, we don't actually. We actually try and get rid of them. But here we are. Okay. So which C do you want to start with? Uh, so the idea is that if we, if we were picturing these four words, these four C's, they'd sort of be in a circle, right? So there's sort of the circle that's going around and the circle can be interconnected. But keep that in mind as, as we're going through here. I don't know that we'll have a graphic on the post, but... Uh, Molly says we'll do that. <laughs> we, we, can, we can do that. We can do that. Okay, good. So we have a circle. And, and let's start with confidence, right? I think this is a big one. This is sort of a nebulous term. It's like, are you confident? Right? But I think Ugh. ultimately that's what we're trying to do. If you look at a lot of coaching frameworks or, or athletic frameworks, confidence is going to be in there. And when we look at confidence, this is sort of this ability to, you know, use sp- I think of it as as sport sort of helping us feel confident, but you know we could also say competent in in our lives, right? So when I learn to hop a, a log, or I learn to do my first pull up, or I learn to you know just straight out like ice skate for the first time, right? Uh, these these are things that you sort of I, I think transfer to the rest of life, right? We now have this. We could say uh, what is the word for that? Uh, self-efficacy so this ability that you believe that you can do something um, just get strengthened by that right so with consummate athlete our our thought was that sport can spiral out into the rest of life and and improve our confidence in in all we do but the question is how do you build the confidence right and so we're looking definitely at these these things can you learn to do something can you learn to do something better can you see progress this month you know in your training block right you do your intervals faster Yeah. And it's funny because even as we were talking about this, to me, I think it actually takes a lot of confidence to be willing to even learn some of these things. So like, you know, as I'm thinking about my own, my own experience in my own life with this, like, for instance, a mountain bike skills session or a mountain bike skills clinic, uh, there were a lot of years where I wouldn't have had the confidence to go to a clinic because I would be so worried about not being able to do something sure so i actually wouldn't go or like i'd go but i'd sort of like hang back and not 
really try on stuff because I lacked the confidence to be able to suck at something. And, and I think that's kind of, I think that's always going to be a barrier uh, with cycling coaching or, or any sort of skills coaching, right? A lot of people, you know, myself included, like there's this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's resistance almost to, to putting yourself out there and trying exactly. to get better, right? But I, you know, case in point on my intake form for coaching or, or plans, it asks the la- one of the last questions is like, can you describe your technical ability? I used to do this on a scale of one to seven, uh, but now I just sort of just say, describe it. And I'm like, think about like, can you do a backflip, right? Probably for most of us, the answer is no. Um, you know, and think about like how often you take the B lo- you know, the, the opt out line, you ride around the log, ride around the obstacle um, or, or just injuries you have, right? And a lot of people have, you know, you would think you would rate lower, but then most people are like, no, I'm good. I'm, there's no problem there, right? But I don't know because I there's always going to be room to improve, right? Again, we're not all doing backflips, right? Not that we're going to get to the backflip level, but if you think about the span and the people you ride with, right? Like a lot of us can get better. So then you would think that this would be a place that we could improve. So ultimately it's not about being confident that you're amazing at something. It's actually being confident that you have room to improve and you can improve. Mm -hmm. Which is, I guess this is the growth mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That there's always room to improve. And this might, I say backflip, right? Which I think is probably where the wording maybe scares some people off. Why would I learn to do a backflip if I'm a road cyclist or something? Right. But this is, you know, the road cyclist who's just very aware and able to stop on a dime and avoid crashes and, you know, maybe do a tiny little hop to avoid a pothole. Right. right, right. But the answer is no for a lot of people, right? Stand and climb, right? If you want to get, this is the one I always go after is that like most people can't stand and climb very well, right? And if you want to get better at climbing, that's probably the best thing to do would be at more of its skills before even fitness, right? So that's that. So that's confidence. So we're going to keep coming back to confidence. Do you want to keep rolling or do you think? Well, my, my last thing on confidence, you kind of mentioned how it spirals into like the rest of your, your work and your, your life from sport. I right. mean, sport's just kind of an easy an easy win in some ways. Um, and it's funny. I always think back to this article I read in tra- or column that I read in triathlete magazine, maybe like 10 years ago. And there was just this line and I've probably even said it on the show before, but the woman wrote this line of like, if I could finish an iron man, I could finish two more minutes of this. Right. And I think about that really frequently, whether it's during a run or whether it's, you know, while I'm trying to get through an article or something. Mm-hmm. So, I think there, there's something huge about accomplishing, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, your first century or marathon or half marathon or 5K or Ironman or whatever. Like most of us have something like that that we can think back to and be like, if I could finish that, I can do this. Well, and I guess that's the point, right? We're talking about skills or, or something like that, but it might be actually getting confidence in your goal discipline uh, or the rest of your life, but from the things that you've done in training, right? And that's really the idea of training is that the training was so comprehensive that the event seems more normal now, right? It's not as scary, right? It's not as far. And that's not that you're, you know, every day you're going in and doing a hundred mile gravel race, but if every day you're, you know, most days you're riding gravel, you're doing the sport, you know, then it's becoming more familiar, right? That almost sounds like consistency. Uh, it could be, it could tie into consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like it's what would give you confidence on the start line of a race, right? Would it be that you did 100 mile ride, you know, got knee pain and then didn't train for two months and then had to go to the race, had to go to the race. Uh, or would it be that you consistently rode gravel, you know, and built up consistently, right. Oh, towards the event. I think that would be, you know, if you had a consistent build to your race, that would be pretty confidence inspiring. Mm hmm. So should we dive into consistency here then? Yeah, and that's really one of our main tenets, right? We've had Dan Cleather on who talks a lot about consistency that, uh, on a past episode, uh, one of my favorites actually. Um, and he has a lot of good stuff around this idea of just, you know, consistent training uh, is, is really everything, right? You wouldn't, when you're making decisions in training or if you're reflecting on past decisions in training, sometimes we're looking back with our, our 2020 hindsight, you know, was my training consistent? right? Could it have been more consistent? How could it have been more consistent? Now, this doesn't mean just doing the exact same thing every day. Like you were actually just talking to a client about the idea of consistency. I think probably most conversations I have are really about this, right? And again, some of it is hindsight. Some of it is, is, well, you know, we want to do this thing. I want to ride 300 kilometers this weekend, right? 300 is the new 200, 200 is the new 160. Sometimes these big things, 
right? They seem exciting. They seem okay. Like more is always better. But then what is the consequence in the next month to my training consistency and health, right? They're, they're intertwined. If I do this big thing, well, some of that depends on who you are right now, right? If you're someone who's been building up to 300, maybe it's, you know, not a big deal, but for a lot of people, this is, you know, we're starting to get into this, you know, risky zone of training duration, you know, event duration, uh, where immune system gets down, you know, our risk for overuse injury gets higher, uh, especially if it's a big disruption, right? Again, if it's a big change from normal, then a consistency, right? That next week you, you might not train, right? Because of the knee pain, because of the fatigue, because you get sick, right? So then we've violated consistency. So then we have to ask, was that a good choice in hindsight or in the future, right? And th- this is the idea. This could be a weekend warrior, right? Where we don't train because of work all week and then we have to make it up on the weekend right i was joking with a client about you know trying to get 10 hours a week in and you know how long that long ride might be on the weekend and i say you know often you'll see like 30 percent of the weekly volume right so in that case it might be a three hour ride if you're training 10 hours a week and i'm like and then you know you, you fill out the rest of the week sort of an hour here a 90 minute here and, and you get to 10 hours but you don't do you know a 10 hour ride on the weekend and then don't train for six days right yeah, exactly. Um, and I think we're also talking about consistency sort of across the board. You know, in our in our book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete, we talk about a lot of different daily habits or weekly habits um, that can all contribute to consistency. Like doing, so, you know, the one I always talk about is the five minutes or 10 minutes of yoga and core in the morning. Now, if you do that once, that's not really moving the needle at all. That is five minutes. But if you do it every day, you know, now you're getting into, you know, between 35 minutes and 70 minutes a week, mm-hmm. which is 50 odd hours a year. And, and I like that five or six minute duration. I don't know why I like six. Six is more than five, I guess. It's like but That's a weird. <laughs> you get warmed up and then you get five minutes in, I guess. The idea, though, is that this action will eventually become more, right? It could become more. But you want to almost find that smallest chunk that gets you moving, right? And this is very much on the front end of of training and health and habits is just what is the littlest, like almost comical amount of something, right? To get started. I was saying to you that they, they talk about flossing oh, one tooth. I was just going to make fun of you and for I'm that. like, what a horrible example. Like flossing one tooth, you have to do with a whole motion. You may as well just floss your whole mouth. And maybe that's what they were getting at. But I was saying like the, the first step might be actually to leave the floss thing out and just touch the floss case you know, every time you go to brush your teeth, because you're already brushing your teeth every day, right? One would hope. Yeah. Uh, side note, don't waste floss like that. That is a huge waste of floss. And it's well, for the one tooth. Yeah, yeah that's very why we're, bad that's, for the we're environment. just going to touch it. For a month, you have to touch your floss container every time you, you, you brush your teeth, right? Anyway. <laughs> so we have main tenant. Um, well, and consistency also, you alluded to it with overuse injury or even, just, you know, dampened immune system, all of that. Uh, you know, that that side of things, consistency also means being healthy as a human, not just performing as an athlete. Um, and that's, I mean, a reason we're super excited about our new sponsor, Inside Tracker. You know, you actually can keep an eye on and all of that blood work, all of that kind of stuff, and really see where you're at. Yeah. And, and most of the people I work, yeah, most of the people I work with, right? Like that's, it, we would say health is part of the reason we're, we're doing this fitnessing, right? But we have to be careful because performance and fitness and health and longevity, you could maybe go all four, right? Those are all related, but not necessarily the same thing, right? We could say, you know, the Olympic, you know, road cyclist, Tour de France cyclist might be giving up some sort of longevity or health right at some point but then this might be whenever we talk about fitness weight loss comes into right but that's not the same as performance yeah i mean personally i even feel like i have an example of this in the past month i was like shifting to you know oh i should really eat more more greens more salad and so i did that for a week where i was having more like big salad for lunch and pretty quickly I felt like absolute crap yeah. because I'm in a super high volume like state right now. And it just, it was very apparent that that was not enough to actually fuel the work I was doing. Well, that's good that you're willing to share that, but it's, that's, that's exactly it, right? You made a, a what might be a healthy decision. You know, if, if the general, you know, North American public, you know, probably would benefit from eating more 
vegetables, right? We probably, yeah. we all shake our head. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But was that a healthful decision during the build, biggest build of, you know, your, your life? Literally. Yeah. Right. <laughs> to essentially, you know, cause the trade off with more vegetables is that you're reducing calories probably, right? Unless you could stack that on top of everything else you were eating, which gets hard. Right. Uh, and, and the red ass thing, one of the warning signs was that someone is eating a uh, nutrient dense diet, right? Which is the hashtag for paleo, you know, and, and all these, a lot of these diets. Like, what a comedic warning. Right. Sign. So it's nutrient dense. So it's a very n- nutritious diet, lots of fiber, a high fiber diet, right? But that means that your calories get low, right? So we have to be careful what the goal is, right? This is always like, is the goal a health goal or is the goal a, a performance goal, right? And, and this is, this and is it, the tricky thing. And it's going to shift throughout the year, right? Like I'm going to, yeah. in a couple of weeks, I'll finish my 100K and, you know, then I can sort of shift back into, you know, a little more maintenance mode where, yeah, like I am maybe going back to that big salad for lunch and doing less volume. And that's, that's great. That's perfect. Right. And, and there's maybe a, an inverted U, right? Where we're, you know, at some point you're eating enough vegetables anyhow, right? And maybe we can overdo that, right? We, th- we want to be, we're all type A people and it's like, well, if 10 vegetables is enough, a hundred's better. And, you know, <laughs> you'll find out probably the next day that, that that was a lot of fiber. And what is an inverted U if not a sideways C? That's <laughs> very true. <laughs> just just hard, got that in there hard for Hard graphically. You. I think that actually becomes a K- yeah. K curve or not, you know. not great. But anyway, yeah. um, all that to say, like consistency doesn't necessarily mean doing the exact same thing day in and day out. Which is very hard, right? Even within the day, right? Mm-hmm. Like what you eat, right? Gets tricky. Yeah, it's, it's, a, and it's hard. That this is the idea of periodized nutrition, periodized training, right? So we know periodized training is, you know, base build, whatever. And then within the week, we can have our rest days and our long days and our hard days versus, you know, the, the tendency is to just, try and keep the exact same of everything try and control it yeah so the i just want to kind of make that clear because like the word consistency sort of calls to mind that like well i i run 45 minutes a day or i ride an hour a day every day and i eat like a consistent pace right if we kept a consistent pace that would mean a pretty steady pace well and like a very like routinized like i eat the same three meals a day like i do the exact same thing every day and that's not necessarily what we're talking about um, it's more of this consistency sort of over time and, and like a thoughtful consistency. Well, I guess that's it. We're zooming out, right? So you could be consistent in that you did a month, you ran every single day. So we could say that was consistent because you trained 30 days in a row, right? But if you can never run again, then that might be less consistent when viewed over the course of a, a year or so, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So we have to be careful. Again, what is the goal? The goal is, you know, we want to be riding in many years from now, then this might change how we go at things, right? Like how hard or how long we might ride, right? Or how we prepare, Mm -hmm. how we fuel, right? This is again, even just with the fueling in your example, like you could have pushed on and pushed on and pushed on, but then what is the consequence as far as, again, stress fractures or burnout? Well, and I have in the past, right? And it has not really played out super well. Mm Mm-hmm. Like gut issues. Yeah, so we've talked about sort of the weekend warrior. We've talked about, again, just fueling for consistency, I think is a, a great uh, addition to that. Um, I guess, again, consistency is confidence building, right? As we're trying to keep this circle growing here, we're, we're on number two of our, our four C's. Um, so we've gone from confidence to consistency, and those sort of feed into each other. Do you want to move to cross training then? It's your favorite thing. It is. And I think when I think of comp, uh, the what is the name of our business? The Confident Thank you. Athlete. Um, to me, cross training is like a big, if you had to summarize it, I'd probably start there. And, and for me, it's because, you know, we, we came into this thinking, you know, we had a couple friends who were just, just seemed to be really adept at, at different sports. You wanted to say adept at adapting, didn't you? No, no. I don't think so. Uh, (laughs) uh, So they, you know, they'd go ski and then they'd go do this. And we were just so awe-inspired. You know, they weren't pro. Like, they're not pro. Let's let's be honest. This is like triathlon, but like times a lot, right? Yeah. But, you know, A, there's a bit of confidence there and that just like they show up. And some of these sports, they're, you know, they're they're pack fail or worse, right? But some of them they're very good at. You know, they've done them for longer. Maybe for me, that would be like mountain biking. You know, I can pretty much roll with whoever. But if we go, you know even road riding if we step a little bit to one way or even further if we if i went and rode with ryan leach you know trial superstar you know it's pretty similar we're both on bikes right but it would be i could keep up we could ride but like he'd be jumping all around and clearing things i wouldn't clear right 
So the idea is that we are going to cross train to try and, you know, boost our confidence by learning new things. We're going to access um, consistency because it might snow so we can go ski, right? This is the other idea with cross training is that it lets us thrive in different conditions. We can run when the, it's raining. We can ski when it's snowing. Uh, it just, it's, it's great from that perspective, right? And, and this is confidence inspiring because we can be consistent. The other thing I really like, such as we're getting older is, you know, we, we have a bodies that need a bit more recovery time. So can we keep fitness for say cycling, moving by doing a run, right? And this gives maybe our, our saddle tissues a, a break, right? Or vice versa. If you're a runner, maybe the cycling one or two or three days, even a week, maybe that keeps the aerobic adaptations going, keeps it everything fresh motivationally. Right. But does that end up in a better athlete than someone who's trying to just like pound away and then gets injured and then gets injured right, right. and then gets injured. Right. So we'd like cross training for that. We did a whole post on cross training. I think there was like 11 or 12 reasons. It was like your Magna Carta, honestly, really, really big. Um, I talked about, you know, this is even just periodization. When we talk about periodization for sport, you know, planning this, you know, when we talk about base, base should be the general preparation, which means we're cross training, right? And I loved this insight. Um, there was this book called, I think it was High Performance Sport by Joyce, I think. It's, it's more of a textbook. But their great insight in that was that to, to, to start peaking for something, you just do less cross training, right? This becomes more specific. And I was just, what? And I was just, you know, the volume decreases and that was their, their thing. Like base is bigger volume. How do you do bigger volume? Well, you do more, more sports so that your body doesn't get overtaxed. Right. And I was just, what a great insight. We're just taking a quick break from today's episode to talk to you about inside tracker. So you want to take charge of your health and wellness. That's why you're here. You're trying to do all the right things for your body to get more energy, better sleep and a healthy immune system. And you probably want to improve your performance. And of course, live a healthy, adventurous life for a long time. But it's confusing out there. There's so much information and misinformation and what works for someone else might not work for you. You want a clear picture of what your body looks like on the inside. A clear measure of whether your diet and exercise choices are helping or hurting. And a clear idea of who and what to trust when it comes to health, wellness, and performance guidance. Founded in 2009, Inside Tracker is the ultra personalized performance system that analyzes data from your blood, DNA, and fitness tracker to help you optimize your body and reach your health and wellness goals. The recommendations that come from the analysis are ultra personalized, and you can choose the ones that are most compatible with your lifestyle. Each recommendation is directly linked to a peer reviewed scientific publication. And Inside Tracker doesn't just show the normal biomarker zones, they show you the optimal biomarker zones and numbers that are best for your body. And now, for a limited time, you can get 25% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com/consummate. That is insidetracker.com/consummate. All right, now back to the episode. And I think this is so important for, I mean, a lot of our listeners here are cyclists. And I think this is particularly important for cycling because cycling is a very one dimensional sport, right? Like you're, you know, generally, especially if we're talking like road or TT, you're in a straight line, your upper body is not doing anything, you know, your hips down to your feet are doing some stuff, but it's, it's very one dimensional. So if we're, you know, never putting our arms over our heads, if we're never, you know, doing like any kind of back bend where you well, actually come back. And you're up. still in one line, right? Like this is side to side and spinning, right? There's a lot of, you know, tumbling. Yeah. It's a lot of movement directions. I'm trying to think of the word that you're not using. Um, and now I'm not getting it, but planar. So you're in different planes of movement, right? So side to side, you know, again, spinning, you know, maybe tumbling. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully not tumbling whilst on the bike but <laughs> no but we talked on the dan john episode certainly we talked a bit about tumbling and rolling right and, and at some point we might need to fall but again this becomes awareness that again you might not do a full backflip but it might be looking around sort of behind your shoulder like is the reason we can't do that mobility but is it mobility because we haven't been actually practicing this in other sports yeah no it's funny every every friday morning when we do our consummate athlete yoga zoom with our our coaching clients, I start every single session with this like over the shoulder, like looking stretch, because I think it's just so important for cyclists to be able to look over our shoulders while we're riding. And so few of us have access to 
any kind of good range of motion with that. So, right, right. So it, by doing these other sports, we're trying to stay open to these ranges of motion, right? Mm-hmm. So again, we you pick what you're interested in. Swimming, arms are overhead, right? We're having to be in a different, you know, uh, we're, we're laying down, right? But we're in an aqueous environment, right? So this checks off a lot of things. I always ask you, you know, has someone done sliding sports in their past, right? You're an example of someone who didn't really. <laughs> who has not. So what I see with that is, you know, the people who have ice skated or skied of some type you pick your skiing discipline um what's another sliding sport that i'm forgetting baseball yeah i guess sure yeah some sort of skidding right so when we start talking about like tires on a bicycle skidding or just gravity based you know you're going down a slippery slope Mm -hmm. right this is where you you start understanding what this is like and how gravity works and how you know sliding you know, it's just a, it's an interesting thing, right? That can transfer from these other sports. Yeah. Well, and to get into consistency or back to consistency via cross training, uh, I mean, how many how many people have you seen? I'd say most of the people you work with who end up injured are not injured doing their sport. They're injured doing like day to day, like I picked up my kid or I squat, you know, like I sat down on the toilet even. This is this is my argument for strength training often, which is grouped in with cross training often. Um, it's just like it's not the main sport, but it's, you know, an accessory. Uh, but that's the idea, right, is we shouldn't we shouldn't necessarily get hurt. Dan John said this, you know, in the training of our sport we don't necessarily want to get hurt right that would be a, a training error if we got hurt and it happens you know certainly some of these sports are more explosive or more random um you know or have other competitors right so it sort of happens uh, but we want to try and save it for the competition right but certainly in life this is indeed as you say like this is it, life can get risky right we slip on ice kids jump on us um you know putting your shoe on these type of things, right? Are often how this, this happens. So that's when I'm uh, using these four C's, this is sort of what I'm checking through, right? Is, is what are our movement options, right? Again, this is so that we can be consistent across different, you know, we're traveling, there's weather's poor, our bikes are broken. Can we be consistent with these different movements? Um, but this cross training just ties into everything again, because it ties into the consistency and it ties into it just more options to learn to do a pull up, learn to ice skate, learn to mountain bike, learn to hop a log, just more chances to boost your confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Do we want to get into the fourth C? Yes. And I mean, this is, this is a big one. This is the big C. It's, it's certainly one that's been, I'll say lacking in the last year. We've been challenged. Very hard for people in the past So this one is community is the last C, the biggest of the C's. Arguably why we started the podcast in the first place. Right. And so this is the the why I think for especially people who you know we're in this, you know, lifelong athlete, you know, we're we're age groupers, we could say we're masters athletes. You could say you're a you masters. Know, I, athlete. I think on some level most people would say that their their sporting is for community, right? They want to get out and chat with people, they want to be with their friends, they want to, you know, experience these adventures together right it's it's not everyone there's a scale there between our we could call them introverts to extroverts but i think that's that's a part yeah i mean certainly feeling like you're you're part of something whether you know you do most of your training alone and then you know you're at races but you at least like know a few people or you know you feel like you know you're part of a club even though you do a lot of training by yourself all that kind of stuff i mean we've seen we've seen a lot of younger racers i'll say who never really found that community because they were so focused on the race itself that they very quickly ended up leaving the sport within a couple of years. And with young athletes, for sure, that's one of the things, you know, we're thinking about, is it fun? And then it, are there friends there? So these are the two Fs. Um, too right. many acronyms. We've yeah, gotten, always, we've gotten too I mean, far. everything in frameworks and coaching and it just seems like is, is acronyms, but when you, you, you know, the classic list is 10 reasons kids stay in sport, 10 reasons kids leave sport, right? And this is the idea that their friends aren't in the sport. This makes sense. Why would you be in a sport where your friends are out, you know, driving cars and, you know, whatever else they do, skateboarding? Would you stay in cycling, you know, with these people who aren't necessarily your friends, right? So the, the trick is to try and make it so that the social group is is there. So it makes no sense that we don't apply that same principle to adults, right? Like, it, mm-hmm. it's not like we change as we get older and suddenly don't need a community or don't need friends like we all want to go out and 
play with our friends no, at some point. And, and, and I, I would say I'm a perfect example. Like, especially as I get older, like I won't ride for me to ride over 90 minutes with on my own is very hard. I can I can attest to this like every day. If you're just like, OK, going out, I'll be back in three hours and then like right around 90 to like 215 back in the door. Yeah. 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 It's it gets harder and harder. Right. And this is the idea. What's that saying? It's like if you want to go long, you know, go with a group and then if you want to go fast go alone right and Ooh, is, yeah yeah there's there's something to that effect right and the idea is that then you have redundancy in terms of like if you get injured you know you, there's a little more safety in this as well right so this is why you can go long if you need a spare tube you have a friend there many times i have any fond memories of just you know we we you know three of us are there and we end up you're like pulling someone with a broken tube and someone's you know handlebars are snapped in half and you know somehow oh, fun memories you're right <laughs> somehow we oh i love stuff like that right it's very macgyver get out of the woods mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know and you're laughing and someone crashes and you know i don't know it, it's it's this is the idea right and just you just go out and you talk with someone for five hours and, and I, I think that's just it's pretty important. Again, there's going to be a range of importance for people and that, that's okay. But I think when we think about what is racing, right, it's, it's usually against other people. So I think the other thing is we need to have in our training, if we want to think about this just from a training perspective, there needs to be some element of community, we'll call it. But, you know, there needs to be another person there in the training and that would be a gap. So that's what I'm looking for a lot of times is like, is there any element of group riding or riding with people? because this is going to be a gap when we get to the race and all of a sudden you're riding with like 60 of your closest friends. <laughs> right. 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 It's going to be pretty shocking if you've never ridden around people. And it's going to be less fun if you, you know, if you're at a race, like I've, I've been in this situation a lot of times where you're at a race and you don't know anyone and you know, everyone around you is like chatting with other people and you know, seeming to be having this like time of their life and you're sort of just like, just standing there. You don't know anyone. It's kind of awkward. Well, it gets tougher, right? And again, how long will someone persist with that, right? Yeah. If, we, if we want to do this for a long time, this is the challenge, I think, as individuals, but also as race organizers and club organizers to be inclusive and get people in and, and welcome them and, and help them, you know, find confidence in that that setting, right? So it's certainly the community is, is a way that we're going to access our, our confidence, you know, feel like people like us and, you know, they're inviting us, but also that we can you know, invite people on a, a run or invite people to do this or do that. The other thing is I think community ties into cross training. We, you might be only thinking about like uh, mountain bike racing, but I'm saying, could we get other communities, right? So then we can access different communities w as the weather changes, as our ability changes, as our interest changes. So this might be our CrossFit community. I have lots of clients who love, you know, a gym sort of community. And this is a different group of people often than your road cycling friends on the Saturday morning group. That's good. Right. Because the Saturday morning group ride friends might be, you know, great to talk to about one thing. The strength training athletes might be better to talk to about another thing. Right. Or into different interests, different connections, you know, in outside of life. Right. This is the other thing, too, is this spirals into jobs and, you know, recreation outside of sport. For sure. Yeah. And I, I always laugh. It's also I think there's there's a confidence one in this for me, too. I, I laugh when I think about this. Because I think about when we went out to Whistler in 2017 to do Iron Man, we didn't know anyone. And I will say Iron Man, as far as like, if you want to find a community, Iron Man is not the place to do it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we could have triathletes on who. Well, I'm sure say. you could have. Maybe. I don't know. You can have a local triathlon club. This is not me saying that like triathletes in general don't have communities, but like an Iron Man race is not where you're going to find people who really want to chat with you for the most part. Um, but when we were out on the run or I was out on the run, all of a sudden I heard someone like shouting my name and it was a woman who was working at one of the aid stations and she recognized me because in 2015 we'd been out to Whistler for Crankworks and while you were racing, I decided to do a women's downhill clinic and I was terrified of the idea of doing it, but I was like, okay, I want to get better at mountain biking. I know this is like the way to do it. So this woman happened to be in the same downhill clinic. We rode the chairlift up together. Mm. Like that clinic alone made me feel so much more confident at mountain biking. But like, holy crap, to have that like person cheering for me during Ironman at the aid station, like because I had, you know, had the confidence to go to this mountain bike clinic to like chat with her on the lift, like make friends, have that like very tiny shred of community. It's not like we stayed in touch or like, you know, I'm like her, you know, the 
godparent of her child or anything like that. Like we just had this one interaction. So it doesn't really necessarily even take much to put to like to have a community. It's pretty amazing, like in athletics. Like Well, and I guess that's it. Your community could be, you know, the person who you say hi to, you know, as you run by or something as well, right? It it doesn't necessarily have to be your best friends or even people you see outside of the sport. Mm hmm. Right. I'd say last summer, like here in town, there there ended up being a group of probably like five or ten women and, and a couple of guys who just happened to run at the same time as me every day. And it's not that we ran together, but like we'd wave and say hi. And just like I'd say within the first month, like, you just get this huge smile on your face every time you saw them. Right. Just because like it's this weird like mini almost community. Well, and you have a, a decent group here in town now uh, for running as well. And what I see with that is not that you guys run even have a set schedule, you know, or, or day of the week. It's not a Tuesday run, but, you know, you'll try and coordinate a bit on distances or, you know, everyone's going to do, you know, this big run this one weekend. And again, this is the idea of like when you go long, it's nice to have people with you again in case someone gets hurt. Uh, for navigation, but also just motivation, right? Like you talk to people and you keep them going. Whoever's having the rough day, you sort of motivate them along. That person has to keep going because they want to, you know, keep up. Just there is a bit of that social comparison that motivates you to keep going when you would, like me, when I would just come back at 90 minutes because it got boring. Yeah, for sure. Um, and this is the idea of consistency, right? It's like if I know that we're meeting on Sunday, it's a lot harder to bail right? Because we're, yeah. we're going to go and it's a lot harder to bail on the total distance we were going to do, right? This is why training camps are often done in groups because you get really tired and you'd go home if you were left to your own devices. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right? So again, challenging right now, but I think we're, we're hopefully on the way up there where those communities can start coming back. So it's something to think about in your own training. If, if this has dropped off understandably over the last year or two, you know, how can you start grouping in different communities, different sports, different, you know? Yeah. Well, we've even had a lot of fun on that note with uh, doing with consummate athlete coaching clients. We've done this Friday morning yoga and, you know, not everyone turns on their video, but a lot of them do. And, you know, it's obviously not the same as being in a studio. But then again, we wouldn't all be in a studio because we're all over the place. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every Friday morning at 7 a.m., like, boom, we're we're on there. We're on video. Like, I think everyone's really enjoying sort of that like mini community sense. And I, and this is not to say you have to join consummate athlete coaching, but could you get a group of friends together, you know, even ones who don't live around you and do a virtual like yoga session or something like that. A lot of studios are doing like private, like online sessions now. So you can totally hire someone or, you know, you could all just tune into one video and put that on. Um, I was actually interviewing a couple of the rally cyclists and uh, Pierre-Andre Cote uh, said that he actually will be riding like on Zwift or whatever, but he'll also put on FaceTime and like actually be like chatting with friends who are also on the trainer. And they even do coffee stops on some of the long rides. So they will literally get off their bikes and go into the kitchen and like have coffee on FaceTime mid-ride like they've stopped at a cafe. Hmm. So like they really went hard on keeping that community ride group ride dynamic. Yeah, <laughs> make sure you train that coffee stuff for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a reasonable training <laughs> situation. Okay. So well, we'll sum up here then we'll maybe have a couple more thoughts, but so we have this idea of four C's and they're in a sort of a circle where you enter the circle is your choice or where the gap is in the circle uh, is going to be pretty individual, but we have confidence. We have community we have cross training and we have consistency. And so the idea is that we're we're again using different sports, different disciplines to access, you know, different communities of people, different sports, different seasons, different environments, different movement skills. That's going to help spiral, if you will, into different or, or sorry, enhanced consistency. So we're going to train more often, move more often, be, you know, fitter, be healthier, uh, avoid injury, avoid burnout mentally. Right. I think just by changing the, the, you know, not the same thing every day. Um, so we've done that. We've accessed different communities, as I say, through the different sports, which is the cross training. And then all of those are sort of spiraling around back to confidence that you're building by, you know, having a, a, a built out community, by being competent in lots of different things uh, and then being consistent. Right. Ultimately, we're going to show up on that start line on that group ride or just, you know, to face the day knowing that we've been consistent in doing, you know, what's right and what's, you know, making us progress in whatever discipline or sport or, or movement area we want to progress in. 
Yes, and all of that leads to being a consummate athlete who lives a healthy, adventurous life. All right. So on that note, let's wrap this episode up. We hope you enjoyed our our four C's. Hopefully this has given you some food for thought. You can head over to consummateathlete.com to check out the show notes. We'll link to you know relevant episodes that link up with each of the four C's. And yeah, have a great week and we will see you next episode. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you enjoyed this or any of our past episodes, do us a solid and leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. And check out our book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete, over at consummateathlete.com. Questions or comments? Find us over on Instagram, at consummateathlete, and we will see you next week.